So in this series of videos you will learn at least three different ways in which to draw the same thing using charcoal. I say at least three because there are a few variables you can do to each of these like adding white charcoal. Alright let's get on with it. So this first one I called traditional method because it's one that most people would think of when drawing with charcoal is mentioned. It's what's taught in schools around the world and is the most intuitive and straightforward. It's not too dissimilar to drawing with graphite on paper. You draw exactly what you see, usually on white heavyweight paper. How you draw it isn't vital in this video, but it's the technique what's the main focus here. However, as you hear, I'll talk you through some of the processes and observations and thoughts while, I'll, while I'm drawing. And then, um, as it's a Halloween special, I'll give you a little bit of a sort of Halloween-y story. So as you can see here, I started in the darkest areas um, and I've started in the inside of the nose which has got the, the dark black shape um, with very little to no gradient. And then I moved on to the eye socket here as well which is not too dissimilar in which uh, it has quite a solid dark shape with just a little gradient onto the left and then I'm starting on the other eye socket with the darks again. So you can see a pattern here of starting with the darks, um, starting with the most dark solid shapes, and then uh, working on these gradients there. You can see I've used a Q-tip or cotton bud, and I've just picked up some of the dark uh, charcoal powder that's already on the paper, and I'm using that to blend out my gradient. And what's left on there, I'm also using that to tone the paper a little bit as well rather than to having to tone by just uh, using the charcoal pencil. I can get quite a soft tone uh, plotted in, um, but it's quite difficult to get an even tone with a Q-tip. Um, you might be better off using uh, perhaps a makeup brush, like one of those uh, big fluffy uh, brushes for putting blusher on. Um, something very soft uh, will probably benefit most. Um, and you just uh, pick up some of the charcoal dust and uh, spread it onto the paper, apply it to the paper and then work in your texturing from there, so making it darker in areas and, and lighter in others. This technique does rely uh, quite a lot on your drawing skills and uh, your ability to judge values and tonal relationships. Um, there are certain techniques and uh, ways in which you can um, make this a little bit easier to do uh, if you're just a beginner starting out. Um, one would be you just make yourself a little tonal gradient and compare the tones to your drawing and the reference image. Um, try and match them up as best you can. Um, another way is also to um, trace the outlines of your reference image uh, like I started out here. Um, and that way you start with a good solid strong foundation um, and uh, accurate lines to, to begin with. If you are interested in uh, giving this drawing a go yourself, um, I've put a reference to the image in the description uh, in which you can print it out and um, there's also links to um, some of the products I use and equipment I use uh, for you to purchase on Amazon if you want to. Um, probably be releasing this uh, as a full full length tutorial with all three um, methods of drawing it with charcoal um, probably a bit later on uh, available to purchase from Gumroad and uh, most likely on my Patreon as well so stay tuned um, uh, I'll post links in the, in the description as soon as that comes about any questions you might have just leave them in the comments and enjoy the rest of the video so most of you have probably heard of the Salem Witch Trials of Salem, Massachusetts that happened back in 1692 in which more than 200 people were accused of being witches, 30 of whom were found guilty, 19 of those were hung, 5 died in jail and one man was pressed to death, which sounds a bit gruesome. So about 25 people were killed or died in those Salem Witch Trials. But um, I want to talk about something a little bit more local to me. So jump back across the pond and go back about 50 years to the southeast of England, UK, about three miles from where I currently live. And I'm going to tell you about a horrible man called Matthew Hopkins. 
So Matthew Hopkins was an English witch hunter whose career flourished during this English Civil War. He claimed to hold the office of Witch Finder General. Although that title was never bestowed by Parliament, his activities mainly took place in East Anglia. Hop Hopkins's witch finding career began in March 1644 and lasted until his retirement in 1647. He and his associates are responsible for more people being hanged for witchcraft than in the previous hundred years and was solely responsible for the increase in witch trials during those years. He is believed to have been responsible for the executions of over 100 alleged witches between the years 1644 and 1646. In the 14 months of their crusade, Matthew Hopkins and his colleague John Stern sent out to the gallows more accused people than all of the other witch hunters in England over the previous 160 years. The works of Hopkins and John Stern was not necessarily to prove any of the accused had committed acts of maleficium, an act of witchcraft performed with the intention of causing damage or injury, but to prove that they had made a covenant with the devil. According to his book, The Discovery of Witches, Hopkins began his career as a witch finder after he overheard women discussing their meetings with the devil in March 1644 in Manningtree. In fact, the first accusations were made by Stern himself, and Hopkins was appointed as his assistant. 23 women were accused of witchcraft and were tried at Chelmsford in 1645. Four died in prison and 19 were convicted and hanged. Hopkins and Stern, accompanied by the women who performed the pricking, it was common belief held that a witch could be discovered through the process of pricking their skin with needles, pins and bodkins, were soon travelling over eastern England, claiming to be officially commissioned by Parliament to uncover and prosecute witches. Together with their female assistants, they were well paid for their work and it has been suggested that this was the motivation of their actions. Methods of investigating witchcraft heavily drew inspiration from the demonology book of King James. Although torture was nominally unlawful in England, Hopkins often used techniques such as sleep deprivation to extract confessions from his victims. He would also cut the arm of the accused with a blunt knife, and if she did not bleed, she was said to be a witch. Another of his methods was the swimming test, based on the idea that as switches had renounced their baptism, water would reject them. Suspects were tied to a chair and thrown into water. All of those who swam, or floated, were considered to be witches. Hopkins was warned against the use of swimming without receiving the victim's permission first. This led to the legal abandonment of the test by the end of 1645. Hopkins and his assistants also looked for the devil's mark. This was a mark that all witches or sorcerers were thought to possess that was said to be dead to all feeling and would not bleed, although it was sometimes a mole, a birthmark or an extra nipple or breast. If the suspected witch had no such visible marks, invisible ones would be discovered by pricking. Therefore, witch prickers were employed, who pricked the accused with knives and special needles looking for such marks, normally after the suspect had been shaved of all body hair. It was believed that the witch's familiar, an animal such as a cat or dog, would drink the witch's blood from the mark, as a baby drinks milk from the nipple. Hopkins's witch hunting methods were outlined in his book, The Discovery of Witches, which was published in 1647. These practices were recommended in law books. Some of Hopkins' methods were once again employed during the Salem witch trials which I mentioned earlier. Matthew Hopkins died at his home in Manningtree, Essex, on the 12th of August 1647, probably of pleural tuberculosis. He wasn't much older than 28. According to historian Russell Hope Robbins, Hopkins acquired an evil reputation which later days made his name synonymous with finger man or informer paid by authorities to commit perjury, the intentional act of swearing a false oath. What historian James Sharp has characterised as a pleasing legend grew up around the circumstances of Hopkins' death, according to which he was subjected to his own swimming test and executed as a witch, which, no pun intended, would have been a more appropriate demise. And if you like this video, you might like this one too on how to draw a pear using charcoal. Or you might want to watch this playlist here. Don't forget to subscribe, leave a like. It'll really help out my channel immensely. I'll see you in the next video.